Well, last Sunday was a nice topic that Suni spoke, and the previous few weeks we had Penmi and and Stanley share with us on some amazing topics, and I just felt I need to build it up on that. And I've titled my topic this morning as boundaries. We're living in a very interesting period of time that we are told constantly to watch our distance and our surroundings constantly because people are not afraid to trespass into our boundary line. And at times, those kind of trespasses could even be physical, mental, emotional violences which can lead to some dangerous zones. Okay? And I just felt boundaries are often designed so that we remain well within the sphere that God has permitted for us. Boundaries were set not by man, right from the beginning. God set it in the Garden of Eden and he set it up very beautifully in the Garden of Eden where he told Adam and Eve that you have everything to enjoy but here is the boundary that you should not violate. Okay? And therefore Adam and Eve both violated that boundary that God put for them by consuming that fruit which led to the eternal destruction of human life. And the first man sinned in the garden and the last man, Jesus Christ, had to redeem mankind through being an obedient son of his father. And therefore, we have freedom today and a solution to attain eternal life through Christ Jesus. It's interesting for the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 28, do not move an ancient boundary wall set up by your forefathers. Do not move it. Do not try to tamper with it. The commentators say this was both physical and spiritual boundary line. And the word forefathers in most of the commentaries says set up by wisdom of people over the years of time. Okay? I'm studying law and I've also done my law in the military, military law. And one of the fundamental premises of law is that when a law is made, it's constantly asked to check even before the implementation of the law, is there any culture? Is there any value? Is there any tradition among that community? Are we violating by bringing this law? Because the culture and the practice of wisdom is always enhanced as time goes by. And the Bible says, do not ever try to tamper with something that has been set in place by wisdom or by people who have walked ahead of you. And therefore, Bible makes a very interesting assumption. The assumption that it makes is God honors age. And therefore, there's a proverb which says, every gray hair is to be honored. Rise up when you see people in age ahead of you. Okay, Honor people who have got gray hair, which means they've seen life ahead of you and they've learned some interesting lessons out of their life and therefore you follow them. When you don't follow them, you become a trespasser and you violate the very essential fundamental boundary line that God put and the consequences are bore by you. I said this before and I'm saying it again. The Bible is about three C's. Whole of the story of the Bible is three C's. It's all about choices. People who made good choices and people who made bad choices. That's all the Bible is all about. Every life you take is about people who made good choices and bad choices. And life that God gives you, God gives you enough to ensure that you will set. The moment you made a choice, you set up circumstances by which you will live by those choices. You set up the circumstances. The moment I make a choice, God sets in circumstances for the choice that you have made. If you made a good choice, God set the circumstances of blessings. And if you made a bad choice, the circumstances is disobedience brings pain. And therefore you will inherit curses and things that like that which are there in your life. And the second thing, third thing that happens when you have set up circumstance, uh, circumstances, you will eventually live to live to see the consequences of the choices that you have made. Today, I'm able to see some consequences at the age of 47 that I have made when I was 17, 16. Some good choices I made at that age of my life and therefore I'm able to see the consequences that I've lived by. 
by the fruit that I have borne out of my life. There were some bad choices I have made and I'm also able to see the consequences and sometimes those consequences make me regret. I wish I had somebody who had advised me to make the right choice in those because life will show you what you are at the end of it. You will get to see your life. Many of us think we'll get to see a life in heaven. No, 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 no. Portion of it you'll get to see, but most of life you will see it on earth. Soon you will see. You will see how your children will behave based on the consequences that you have made to disciple them, to discipline them, or to leave them in a liberal world, okay? Or leave them in, in, in the way that you have gone. I have known of people who have not conceived, and when I had conversations with a few of them, it, it turns out that their parents have adopted to the concept of abortion and therefore they have aborted so many children in their lifetime that their daughter, the one that they decided to have, is not able to conceive. Okay? Because of a choice that they have made, they have left the next generation affected by, by that. And, and, and we pray and we pray for ancestral curses. We pray for generational sins to be forgiven because somebody has abused the boundary that God has put and the children bear the consequences of that violation, okay? Very simple, a successful CEO will go to prison if he crosses the financial boundaries in a company. The president of a country can be impeached if he crosses the legal boundaries, okay? A marriage can be destroyed when one of the spouse violates the element of trust in that marriage, either by, by adult, adultery or sexual marital relationship or anything it could be, the moment you violate, the marriage comes to a destroyed state. A ministry could be disgraced when a pastor crosses the moral boundary. You can devastate the whole building of God's kingdom. And therefore, boundaries are very important and we need to set it in place. Those of you who read, she's supposed to be Ladinus, is an excellent counselor on boundaries. Please, there are many videos on the YouTube, watch. But she says, why do we set boundaries? And I like some of the few things that this particular person speaks about, okay? She says people need to set boundaries to take care of your own needs. You're not setting boundaries, not because of anybody else. You're setting your boundaries for your own needs, for your own safety. Sometimes boundaries are set as per her view for your own needs and for your own safety. So much so, the Bible is so particular about boundaries, it gave an instruction in the book of Leviticus to his Israelites. He said if, that if you end up building a house which has got an open parapet without a boundary, and somebody climbs up onto your building and falls, you are liable to be part of their death. And therefore, the Bible says, ensure that you are fenced your parapet and you don't have an open fencing on top because you will be responsible for not having boundaries of safety within yourself. Okay? So it's for your own needs. Second reason says to, to, to have more freedom so that you're able to focus on what is important and what is not important. People set boundaries so that you're able to focus on what is important and what is not important. Okay. Third reason, La Dennis says that we set up boundaries to protect our own physical and emotional space from distractions. We set boundaries. Okay. And I can give you some such example of a, of a boundary that we have set in our marriage. Nobody in our house surfs the internet in a secluded, isolated, closed room. Anybody who wants to surf the internet has to sit in a common, open space. Somebody say amen, yeah? Correct? Nobody in our house, in my house, nobody, including me, there is no password that my son doesn't know, my daughter doesn't know. I've given them all freedom to search through, browse through the history of my phone and my laptop any time of the day. Okay, they have the freedom. And same freedom I have upon the gadgets that they use. Same freedom Sunni has in my house. Okay, so that we are careful because when we are secluded and isolated and nobody is watching, there is a great temptation for us to visit a wrong site. And therefore, we are guarding by setting a boundary. That boundary has kept pornography out of my house. It has kept any kind of sin that could enter through the media into, into my house. It's guarded and protected, but we set that boundary into place. Like Dennis says, sometimes people set boundaries to explore creativity in their own lives. 
something that God has invested in you can only come out when there is a set boundary that you define. Okay. And finally, she says, people need to set boundaries so others know how to treat you with respect and care. Okay. I'm not saying that all these are, are to be followed, but I liked her teaching. I liked the teaching of this woman. And I enjoyed reading some of her books as I was preparing this message. Boundaries are very, very important. And the whole of the internet has got a lot of teaching on boundaries. Professional boundaries, sexual boundaries, marriage boundaries. You can just type and you will get loads of message on how you need to be. There's a topic on good boundaries. Not that I've taken anything from that, but I listened to them as I set my talk this morning. So boundaries are very important. I'm going back. To the first verse, do not move the ancient boundary wall set by wisdom of people. Do not move it. There is great wisdom in the people who have seen. And we don't want you to learn the hard way in your life. Okay, and I'm going to take you through some stories and share. Boundaries also appear in life. They also appear in life. I do not know how many of you are part, but in my school, I was part of a Catholic school. We were never told to bring ruled paper. We were always asked to bring blank paper. And the first 10 minutes of the class, our teacher would teach us first thing to draw margins. Anybody remembers my age, my generation? Any of your teacher taught them how to draw margins? Remember, sir? Thanks. Yeah? Joshua? Okay. First thing we were taught was to take this blank space and we were taught to draw margins. And she would say this, Mrs. Lee, the whole paper is full, but what I want you to do is to control your thoughts to express what you want to express in this space. And this is what she would say. If you write the best of the answer in this space, I will give you zero. All that you want to say has to come here. And then she would write, teach us to draw lines. And how would we do it? We would have a ruler and we would first put... I'm going back to our school days. Guys, any, any fond memories coming up to you? Exactly. In life... That's how we were taught. And then we joined this line to this line, this line to this line, this line. And then our paper was ready for writing. Okay? In life, you learn through your school experiences. Okay? Today, children play football and cricket. But in my school, it was first taught on a drawing paper like this. Football was taught to us in a classroom first before we went to the field. And one of the things that they would teach us is they would talk to us the boundary. And this is what it would say. My, my sports teacher. I'm a national basketball player. And when we play basketball, this is what it says. Guys, a good player keeps the ball within the boundary. Are you with me? A smart player. Because every time the ball has gone out of the boundary, the opponent has time to take his own sweet time if he's on the winning side, to delay the match. Therefore, a good smart guy plays within the boundary. We are taught to ensure that we remain within the spectrum of boundary. The growing pattern of life also appears that so many things of do's and don'ts that we advise you not to do and what to do comes from the segment of a boundary. There is not a single gadget that you have purchased, my friends, which doesn't have a boundary. Your phone says, do not throw it into the fire. Correct? It comes with a boundary. There is no technical sphere that doesn't work within the boundary. Your Wi-Fi doesn't work when you cross the boundary. Are you with me? Everything has to fall within its space. So the whole life itself falls into the segment of boundary. And therefore, I want to share an interesting passage this morning from 1 Corinthians, which sets for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, so that I read that and then set my talk as I move forward. Are you with me? Yeah? 
1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll read from verse 1 to a couple of verses. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank, this, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered out over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples for us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. What is the writer saying? These things happen so that you define your boundaries well so that you don't violate those boundaries. That's how Paul is writing it. And some of them he says, do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. So the boundary he's given to us. Then he says, they, the people sat down and ate to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, boundary again, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by a destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Hallelujah. Okay. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear brothers, flee from idolatry. I speak, sensible, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. He is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we take, give thanks, participation in the blood of Jesus. And he's not the bread that we participate in the body. Because there is one law and we are many, are one body. So we all partake into this one. Consider the people of Israel. Do not, do not those who eat sacrifices participate in altar. Do I mean that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to participate with demons. Do not drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons too. Do not have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of the demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger? And finally, he says in verse 23, everything is permissible, but everything is not beneficial. Everything is permissible, but everything is not constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but for the good of the others. Okay? Paul writes this passage defining certain boundaries that he asks us to abstain from in life. It's interesting that he goes back to the Old Testament and he says people have violated some basic fundamental laws in the past and you know what happened to their lives. And he wants us to learn from what happened to their lives. And one of the ways he asks us to learn is to set boundaries that we don't cross them in our lifetime. And we are careful that we don't violate them. Okay? Let me give you a life example of trespassing. Life of David. The Bible says one afternoon, while David was relaxing, he actually watched a woman bathing from his balcony. And that led to violating five out of the ten commandments. Are you with me? He, in an instant of trespassing, broke five out of the ten commandments. Okay? The first one that he violated. He violated five out of ten commandments by just trespassing on a relaxed evening. Maybe he was just having a cup of tea. Maybe he was having a cup of coffee. Just enjoying his lavish evening while all his trusted generals were at war. He ended up violating five commandments out of the ten commands. He not only fell into adultery, became a person who will cover to the neighbor's wife. He bore a false witness against Uriah. Okay? He shall not steal. Those of you who know the IPC, 
IPC stealing means physically taking something that belongs to another person without the other person's consent. That is stealing. He actually moved his wife, Uriah's wife, from her room to his bedroom without consent. He stole the affections of the wife that belonged to another general, another army person that works for him. Are you with me? A simple evening violated five out of the ten commandments. What a, what a, what a tragedy that has hit David. You know what many of us think David recovered. David actually never recovered from this great sin of Bathsheba. He did it in secret and his son slept with his concubine on a rooftop while everybody was watching. What a pity. He did it secretly. But his son said, I'm better than my dad. And he set up the bedroom on top of an open roof while the whole nation was watching. He slept with a concubine, which is David's concubine in a public square. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. What a disaster that came upon the life of David. Do you think David was pleased? I'm sure he would have been filled with shame, filled with remorse, regretted. What a mess. What a mess. What a mess I have made out of my life. That's the tragedy of trespassing. When you trespass the fundamental value of God, you will reap the consequences in your lifetime, my friends. You will reap the consequences in your lifetime. And I can say that with great confidence in 30 years of walking with people, praying for them. It's amazing that they have violated the fundamental right. And that is what happens. When you trespass on a casual evening like King David, you will end up breaking the very fundamental code of God's conduct. And that will lead to a disaster in your life. I'm not scaring you. I'm not making you afraid. But I'm telling you, what lies when you cross a trespass boundary? Okay? Some key implications when you trespass. First of all, consequences will follow. David himself wasn't ex exempted from consequences. God said, okay, you asked me for forgiveness, I will forgive you. Eternal condemnation, I will not block you out from, from, my, from the Lamb's book of life. You will continue to remain. The Lamb's book of life does not just appear only in the, in the, in the book of Revelation. It appears three times. It appears twice in the Old Testament. And he does say that I'll not blot you out from the Lamb's book of life. He says, but David, you will bear the consequences. You will not be exempted from the consequences of your sin. Okay? You will become, your, your conscience will become seared. It will become seared. You'll find that you've come to a place where you're unable to distinguish between what is good and what is bad. You know, it's interesting. I worked in the airport and the aviation. We have an interesting saying. When wrong is repeatedly done, wrong begins to appear right. When wrong is repeatedly done, you kept doing, kept doing, kept doing, kept doing, kept doing. When you constantly do wrong, it will start to appear right and you begin to justify for the wrong. Are you with me? Okay? Try this if you had a maid in your house. Try this with your maid. Okay? If suppose your maid was supposed to come at 10.15 and she starts to slowly come at 10.30, 10.45, 10.50, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one fine day, you became really irritated and addressed her. She started to come at 12 o'clock. You know what she'll say? So what? I've been doing your work, no? Why? Because repeatedly she's been violating the 10.30 time and now she feels justified, right, to come at 12. Are you with me? Simple example. So constant repetition of a wrong will start to appear right. And it will blind your conscience. You will not be able to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. And you will generally flow with the tide of people. Okay? Your conscience will be seared. Control will be needed from an external force. Not a single place that David violated. He could fix the problem by himself. Somebody from outside had to come and intervene. Help them to come out. In the case of David, it was the prophets who came alongside of him 
helped him to violate, to help him to understand and rebuild his life. We're living in a world that says everything is cool. Everything is cool. Nothing is cool in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it's either holy or unholy. That's all. There's nothing called cool holy in between. Yeah, It's holy or unholy. Either you are living righteous life or you're living unrighteous life. And Paul goes on to say, I'm a wretched sinner of all the sinners that I am. I'm a well-learned, educated PhD, but I'm a wretched man in who I am. You will need external force. What happens in a football match when the ball crosses the boundary? How many of you think the game continues to be played? All the players are continuing. Get another ball, we play. No, no, no. What happens? What happens? Guys, you've never seen football? What happens when the ball goes out? Game has to stop. And who interferes? The referee has to come in between. He has to come. For a period of time, everything that the players have been doing comes to a standstill. Stop. And a third person referee decides how to restart your game again. Am I right? Whether it's an overthrow, whether it's a penalty shot or a free shot, he decides what is the consequence of the boundary ball crossing the boundary line. He takes a decision and his decision is final. Are you with me? So when you have violated a boundary in your life, you will need external help and the external help is consciously brought in so that you're able to fix your problem. I've never seen people living in debt fix their debt by themselves. Never. Never happened. Never happened. Okay? I've never seen marriages that are struggling fixed by themselves. No. Very rare. I have not seen in my 30 years. It's always somebody from external who has to come and help them to fix the problem. And so is it in your house. If anything is broken, anything is violated, you will need an external plumber or an electrician or somebody who has to come and fix it for you to restart your life again. And so is it when you break the command. A control from an external source has to be brought in. Sometimes it could be divine or sometimes it could be secular. Whatever it is the call, we need to take. But trespassing will need you for an external force. Okay? And it will stop the process for some time. For some time. I know of a person who has morally fallen down and he wanted to rebuild his life again. He wasn't allowed to preach. He was not allowed to get back to his normal functioning for a season in his life. He had to undergo a strict accountability discipline to prove himself. And for a season, he's been asked to step down as a pastor. I have shut down many of the worship teams for their misconduct, for their some life which is not glorifying. I said, we don't want to have a worship team in the Sunday service. I disbanded them, asked them to get back to sitting in the pews and start to receiving. I've also addressed certain people. If I'm leading worship, I will not sit in the pew. No, 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 no. It doesn't happen like that. You have to be part and parcel as a body ministry to be functional. Okay? You cease the process for a season of time. Insubordination, disrespect, deceit, all these things enter your life and they stop functioning for a certain time. Okay? So is it exactly when there is a growth in your body. It stops the functioning and the doctors have to sedate you for a certain time and remove the growth out of your body for you to become functional again. Are you with me? And how many of you think the surgery is a very exciting, fantastic tenure? It isn't. It isn't. It is filled with anxiety. It's filled with fear. The only person who's fearless there is the doctor who's cutting you. Other than that, everybody is filled with anxiety and pressure and there is a lot of fear, anxiety. Some of us have also felt it's time to see the other side of life on a, on a surgical table. But that's what it takes when you trespass or something that grows within you which is not part and parcel of God's plan and purpose. Okay? Areas that we cross boundaries. The first area that we cross boundaries is mind. When I was a young boy, when I just came to the Lord Jesus Christ in the 19th, from a Brahmin background, my mind was filled with a lot of imageries that I had seen. 
lot of animal chickens. Addicted to porn, addicted to movies, addicted to various kind. When I came and I met Jesus, when I read through the Bible, and this is what I said, my goodness, if this is the Bible that brings life, I want it. I want it. And it has the capacity to cleanse me. And the first book I read was written by a person called Marilyn Carathos. He wrote a book called What is on Your Mind? If you've never read that book, please read that book. The opening passage, the introduction story in Marilyn Carathos's book, What is on Your Mind? is a story of a pastor who has a mega church. But he has morally violated a boundary by having a relationship with somebody in the congregation. And the story begins in that book. True story. It begins of how one morning on a Sunday service, this lady walked up with a seven-month-old stomach and she said, congregation, the man responsible for this is your pastor. It's written in that book. And then the whole devastation happens. And then Marilyn Carathos interviews this man and then writes this book, what is on your mind? What is on your mind? This is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12 verse 30. Love the Lord with Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Are you with me? And with all your strength. Four things that Mark wrote absolutely clear. Okay? It's not just loving God, but he says with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I want to take this word mind, which is now ruining and reigning in this world. Okay, Mind plays an important role in all of us. I don't know whether you like it or you don't like it. Men can strip a woman in the mind. We are capable of doing that. We have that capacity. Our engineering system is so efficient that we can look at a woman and lustfully defrock her completely in our mind. We have that capacity in our mind. And Marilyn Carathos opens out in this book, please read this book, each and every aspect of mind. And the first place that we violate is in the mind. And therefore, Jesus enhanced the standards of the Old Testament much, much higher. He didn't bring it down. Every law in the Old Testament is got enhanced in Christ Jesus. And the law that is enhanced for this is said like this. In the Old Testament, I need to physically have a sexual intercourse with another married woman being a married man to commit the sin of adultery. Jesus said, that's no more the rule now. The rule now is this. If you lustfully look at another woman, you have committed adultery. Are you with me, my friends? Standard has got enhanced in the, in the New Testament. Jesus came to lift the law higher, not the other way around. Therefore, you can imagine what would be the consequences of the act. The very thought itself leads you to adultery. What would be the judgment when you commit it? And therefore, Paul writes it very beautifully. The adulterers, fornicators, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That's what he writes it. Strongly. He calls them out in the Bible. Therefore the mind is to be the area that you constantly guard in. I'm going back to an old technological term that used when the computers were called WS4. Anybody who knows it except for Rama who must be knowing WS4, WS6. WS4, you know that word star 4? We would write once CD dot dot backspace. Right? And then the computer will take its own time. You can go and have your cup of tea, come back. Correct? We used to have an interesting phrase those days. G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. Gigo. Garbage in, garbage out. So you need to understand what is it that you're putting your mind into. Paul says this in the book of Colossians. Set your mind on things above. Hallelujah. Set your mind on things above. God made three things. He made angels, he made human beings, and he made animals. The order of his creation. God said, set your mind on things above. Don't look at the animals. Oh, animals have sexual relationships. I also can. No, no, no. He said, set your things on above. Lean towards a higher calling, not the lower calling. Are you with me? Lean towards the higher calling. Fall towards the higher calling. And this book 
elaborate sin that can fill your bedroom, that can fill your mind, that can fill your idle space. It can even enter your phone. It can enter your history. It can even be part and parcel of your browsing life. Amen? Okay? And you can cross your boundaries in mind. And therefore, we need to be careful that we are not associated with garbage. Because if you're associated with garbage, you will bring out garbage out of your life. Garbage in, garbage out. But if you bring in good sense of God's word, you will constantly protect your mind to be free of it. You know what? The mind says many things. The mind says on a morning, you are so busy, so exhausted. This is what I learned over the years. Life is complicated. Nobody said life is not complicated. Life is complicated. You need to get up in time. You have to catch the bus. You have to run for the train. You look at the local guys in Mumbai. Look at, have you ever been to the Mumbai local train? All you need to do is just stand and you will get inside. And all you need to stand and you will come out. That's the life in Mumbai. People are running constantly from pillar to pillar. Life is complicated. But what is beauty is this. If you set your mind on things above, you will never drop. The most important thing in your life is God. You're constantly tackling what to drop. What to drop. Many of my colleagues who came to church, in the hustle bustle of life, they dropped God. And they're nowhere in their journey. Messed up marriages. Finances have grouped up. They've dropped God out of their list of things that they drop. And I'm glad that at that age, I choose to drop everything else except God. And I was called a moron those days. But that's fine to be a moron. Choosing Jesus to be the one who is the centerpiece of your life. And today when people look at my success and my, my things, it's not because I've been a very master clever guy. I have been a person who's ensured that my mind is set constantly on God, God, God. He is the attraction of my life. In the list of hustle bustle things in my 30 years of journey, never have I stopped reading my Bible. No matter how busy my day is, I would go back to receive from God what he has got in store. It may not be a whole Bible book, but a portion for me to meditate. What is it, God, that you got for me today? What is it? Tell me. Because my mind has to be captivated. And that verse is what I meditate during the day. I discuss with my wife. I talk to my son. I talk to whomever I meet about that verse. But today, I read the book of Exodus chapter 17. And it's so exciting. I've been sharing this every, ever since I've experienced God. I'm meditating on it. Because in the busy hustle bustle of life, I would rather drop sleep than to drop spending time with God. Okay? That is what your mind has to be occupied. Ensure that Marilyn Carathor's story does not repeat in our lives again. That we are not one of those people who have trespassed. The first place that you will error is mind. Second place that you will error is I. Lust of the eyes is what the Bible says. The Bible says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in him, the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he does not, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Jesus also said, the eye is the lamp of the body. And so then if your eye is clear, then your whole body will be full of light. Wow, what a phrase, man. What a challenge. Okay, what a phrase. What a challenge. If you guarded your eyes, if you guarded your eyes, your whole body is in full of light. Your eyes have to be protected. Okay? Isaiah used his eyes. And he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah chapter 6. Okay? In the year Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Hallelujah. Why I said worship is so important. Guys, I worshipped idols foolishly for 18 years of my life. And finding Jesus in 30 years, every time I worship, I see the Lord lifted high. 
exalted. Through my actions, I claim to see God in his throne. I worship God because he deserves that. Okay? And if your eye is clean, your whole body is clean. Whole body is clean. Maximum amount of surgeries are on cataract. Because people don't mind an amputation, but they don't like the vision to become blur. It has to be corrected. Because that's the dangerous place. And Jesus said, take care of your eye. And I want to say this to you. Again, the same book, Marilyn Carathos talks. This pastor's journey began with his eye. David's journey began with I, with Bathsheba. On the balcony, what he saw took him to the bedroom. What he saw took him to the bedroom. Okay? Consciously, you should be careful. Consciously, you should protect yourself. And those of you married men should be so transparent to your spouses to share and diffuse and break it in their, in their lives. Okay? I travel with... Stanley and Wick once in the UK, and I happened to see some, some mannequins that were displayed. And that, in my early years of my life, in my married life, disturbed. And the first thing I did is made a call to Sunni and asked her to pray over me, deliver me, set me free. Then I called up my mentor, spoke to him, and said, this is what disturbed. I got myself prayed and flushed it out of my mind. God prayed, delivered, set free. Delivered, absolutely free from the kingdom of God. Okay? I have traveled to some of the best places, traveled with some of my colleagues, and I, when I look at their lives, one of my colleagues has messed up his entire married life in the early stages of his marriage because he fell for the lust of his eye for another woman. What a disaster. Walking through them, walking with them for me and Sunni has been the most painful journey because it began from the lust of the eye. Jesus wasn't a fool when he said, guard your eyes. Protect your eyes. I want to pause here. Maybe put your, put your arms over your eyes and ask the Lord. Lord, cleanse my eyes. Take a minute of prayer. Ask the Lord to cleanse your eyes. Great. It's good to take these conscious steps to ask the Lord to forgive you as I'm speaking because the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, willing to forgive. The third is the lust of the flesh. Okay? Paul says this. This is Paul speaking, guys, when an encounter with Christ. How much more for us? I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. What a beautiful phrase. Paul uses. The lust of the flesh is so interesting, my friends. Okay? Our body likes to laze around. Do you know that? It loves pleasure. It loves pleasure. It loves massage. Have you ever heard The body has never said enough massage. Correct? Continue. Even for 10 years, karte jao, sote raunga. Correct? Our body likes pleasure. Our body likes food. No? Okay? Our body likes slumber. That's why we don't like the alarm clock. We set it before we sleep. But when it rings, we say, shut up. Correct? And we constantly do that. Our body likes pleasure. And the lust of the flesh is that. Given an opportunity for a body, it likes to do what it likes to. And most of the time, it's disobedience. It explores things outside the boundary. Somebody said like this, lust of the flesh, ordering an ice cream or selecting a life partner is like ordering an ice cream. I don't know how many of you have been to Mangalore. There's a place called Gadabad. Now, there's a place called Abbas. Okay? And you get an ice cream called Gadabad. I don't know whether you've been there. If you've ever been to that restaurant, please go there. You've ordered your ice cream. Nobody's looking at the person who's ordered is not looking at his ice cream, but he's constantly looking at every other different kinds coming there. He's more curious about what others are eating. And somebody said, uh, selecting a life partner is like that. Like after you ordered your ice cream, the other one looks better. 
correct? Lust of the flesh is that. It constantly says what you have is not good enough. You like something else. Constantly. And Paul is saying this. I beat my body man. I beat it. Every time it says my wife is not good enough. I beat it. Every time it says that I'm not good enough husband. I beat it. And I make it a slave. To ensure. That I don't get disqualified. In the race. Okay. It doesn't take great wisdom. To yield to the flesh. It doesn't take great wisdom. Even a fool can do. That's why the Bible says a slumber is a fool. That's what the Bible says. But a wise man is careful. He constantly guards his steps and he's careful. And the lust of the flesh wants you to do things outside of the boundary. Okay? Outside of the boundary. I'm not saying sweets are bad. Bible says honey is good. But too much of it, you will vomit it. That's what diabetics is all about. You have to flush it out. Bring it out. Okay? Not that sweets are bad. But you need to consume it within the limit that God has expected your body to consume. So lust of the flesh. Therefore, the body never likes to go for walks. How many of you felt early morning the body said, get up, get up, go for walks. Get up, get up, go for walks. No, 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 no. no. You have to literally pull yourself out of the bed. Literally. How many of you got up in the morning, get up, get up, pray, pray. You have to pull yourself out of the body, out of the bed and pray. How many of you felt today I'm in the high spirit to lead? No, no, it never happened. You have to pull yourself and eventually it becomes a habit. And I tell couples, guys, spend 10 minutes together in prayer. That's all I'm asking you. Start with 10 minutes morning. The first thing that you do, grab your spouse's hand, sit here, drop everything. Let's pray, man. 10 minutes, 10 minutes becomes 15 minutes, 20 minutes. You have cultivated a culture to be in the presence of God. Start with 10 minutes. If you are not able to give 10 minutes in your marriage, my friends, disaster awaits you. Because a praying family is the most important family. And they will persevere further. Out of 24 hours, 10 minutes I'm asking for you to be undisturbed Away from your phone call, grabbing your spouse's hand and praying. And for singles, 10 minutes in a day, can you just drop everything and be on your knees for 10 minutes? Try it. Your life will change. God delights when you pray. But the lust of the flesh will not allow. You are tired. You had an extensive travel. You are so busy. You cannot do this. No, no, no. Lust of the flesh gives you excuses. But life in the kingdom of God is abundant life. You do everything with the strength that God gives you because you have learned to master the flesh. The fourth is the pride of life. Stanley took us through two interesting teachings on Nebuchadnezzar and, and Belshazzar. What a best teaching that he did for us. Okay? There are two kinds of prides that Obadiah talks of and explained to you. One, you think very highly about yourself. You think you're next to Nebuchadnezzar. Very high esteem about yourself is pride. The second kind of pride that God hates is you look down on people who are less than you. Guard it from both my friends. You may be better, better in my education than me. You may be better than me. Praise God that you're better than me. But don't ever fall into the sin of Edom in the book of Abidaya that they fell on looking down on somebody else. That could be dangerous. Okay, Four areas where you can cross your boundaries and you can fall into a trespassing category of your life. Okay, Good boundaries. Paul said this. Uh, uh, David said this. Okay, David said this. David said this in Psalm. Psalm 39 verse 1. It says, I watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I have put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of wicked people. Hallelujah. What a boundary is put. He's saying, I've actually put a lock over my mouth so that I don't sin. So good boundaries is you should think before you speak, my friends. Have control over your tongue. Don't blabber whatever you feel. Be careful what you talk to another person because what you speak may hurt another person. 
Okay, you have to be careful in the way you communicate. And David says, I have learned to put a muzzle over my mouth. Okay, ensure that you don't cross these boundaries with your tongue. Book of James gives you a whole chapter on how a tongue can put a whole forest on fire. And your life can fall into a devastated state because you've not known how to control your mouth. The second area that, that Jesus asks us, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 18, if, you're, if your eye causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. Okay? He says cut it off. Okay? It is easier and better for you than to go into heaven with one eye. Better. Better not to have it. In other sense, you need to find out what are the circulation of people. I'm very careful whom I interact. I'm very careful, especially in my discipleship. I'm very careful whether what I'm investing is paying results. If it is not results, I withdraw. I don't waste my time. I withdraw. Time is very precious for me. I'd rather invest on something else that will bear fruit than spend time in futility because they're only receiving but never. And Jesus said this, I is the most precious thing. I don't know what is so precious about you. I do not know. In my early Christian life, I had to cut off my parents in my walk with God. I had to go against my parents. Okay, Suni shared a story to you last week. I had to cut off the government of my parents to get the government of mine going. My house is absolutely clear. My dad and mom never violate the boundaries in my house. Neither do, violate, well, neither do we violate their boundaries in their house. When we go to their house, my mother is the queen of the house. And everybody obeys the queen. If she says we will eat karela, we will eat karela. That ends the game. But when my mother comes to my house, Suri is the queen of the house. And everybody in that house obeys the queen. Boundaries are absolutely set. Never has my mother violated, neither have we violated those boundaries. Because we are careful to cut it off and set the government of God's kingdom. And that's the fruit of our barren life. Okay? Our marriage has survived in building on those fundamental essential principles. We are careful who comes and stays with us. We're very careful. We are extremely careful who relates to our children and whom are we relating to. Everything that does not bear fruit, we cut it off. I tell them, thank you man, our journey ends here. Find another place that fits your requirement. Because your life is not producing life into me. And I don't want to ruin my life. You know what? God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. And you have to be the son and daughter. You can't be a granddaughter to, 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 to Jesus Christ. He only has sons. You have to choose. And Jesus said this. If your eye causes you to sin, don't be ashamed to pluck it out. How many of you felt like plucking out your eye ever? Have you tried it out? What a rude statement Jesus is making. But he's making it. He's saying, guys, it's better for you not to have that in your life. And you make it to the other side of Lord's kingdom. Rather than they're destroying your life, your marriage, and everything that you have built up for a devastation. Interesting. We are careful with our eyes. I don't receive from people who don't live what they say. Therefore, my mentors are very carefully selected. I don't receive from people who don't walk the talk. Okay, Stanley is my mentor and I've got other people who mentor my life. But I'm carefully observing them to really replicate what they're doing and what they're saying. We don't want to be hypocrites like Paul says. We are careful. We are careful. Like for example, I don't choose a mentor who doesn't, who doesn't stay awake in church. Who falls asleep. Do you think he's a good mentor for you? Absolutely not. Because you also will end up falling asleep. Because that's, that's the way life is going to be. Therefore you need to select somebody. Who's active. Who's involved. Passionate. Kingdom. And then you will move forward. As you move forward. So cut it off. Everything that doesn't bear fruit. Okay. Marriage boundaries. Sunni and me set very early boundaries in our marriage. We have set some important boundaries in our early years of our walk. This is what we said. Never will I use the word, I will divorce you. Is a boundary that we have set. Never will Sunni say, I will go back to my mother's house. Or I will say, I will go back to mommy. Never it has happened. We have ensured that we have not trespassed. It has never happened that we will manhandle each other. 
We will throw things at each other. We've ensured that we are carefully set our boundaries well. We ensured that our children will always be in the boundary of God, family, church. God, family, church. We will not ensure that it is violated. We are careful in our marriage. And I hope all of young people will be careful. Professional boundaries. Okay, in our sector, it is fine to mentor a woman, but it, this is a professional boundary. I have said, I don't mentor women. If a woman wants mentoring, she gets connected to my wife. Any advice, please go to Sunny. She will give you the advice. But we mentor couples, and we are careful that we have conversations in our professional boundaries. There is nothing called a cool chat. I don't even pat anybody, neither do I allow anybody to pat me. No high five, no body touch. I remain quite away, at least two, two and a half feet away in my conversation with an opposite sex. Because Paul says in the book of Titus, to the pure, everything is pure. To the impure, even what is pure is impure. You have to guard yourself that you don't cross the professional boundaries. We should be careful that you are. Even today, in my office, I have a cabin. But if a lady has to come and have a conversation with me, I will ensure the door is wide open during the time of the meeting. We have conversations. Or I select a place which is on a desk. But never it will happen that we will be sitting. These are some professional boundaries that I've set to ensure that we remain in careful. I'm sharing my own story, my friends. You feel free to add on. Financial boundaries, very important. You, you should be careful with financial boundaries. In my 30 years of God, I want to tell you, my friends, I didn't, I didn't start tithing when I became a Christian. The first thing I read in the Bible is about tithing. And when I read about tithing, I said, what is this tithing? Because that's a, that is said in Malachi, if you tithe, I will bless you. I said, what is this tithing? Give to God 10%. And I started to tithe as a Hindu to the church. And then I became a Christian. Because Bible says, and I want to tell you my friends, it wasn't an easy journey. It wasn't an easy journey. But even in the worst scenario of my life with Sunni, some days we wouldn't have money to run our home. But I said, Sunni, I don't care. Tight is tight. We will give to the Lord what His. And God has been faithful that we've never crossed that boundary. I have given to God what belongs to him. I never played games with God on the financial boundaries. This is what God told the Israelites. I will give you a land which will have a boundary. But when it comes to giving, don't go to the very edges of the field to cut it off. Because I'll give you enough that you don't have to go that. You know, sometimes, in, 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 at least in a Hindu family, before the bartan goes to wash, kar, 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 everything is taken out, correct? He's saying, don't go to the very edge. Give more, give more. People ask me, should I tithe on cross or on net? What a doubt it is. Okay? Lord has said, bring the whole tithe. Give to him cheerfully. Grow to become a cheerful giver. And I'm glad that many in this church tithe more than 20%. I'm glad. They become givers from tithers. And I can see their life running after God. Addressing God, adding to them because God, and so is my life. When I look back, God has been good that we will never borrow or we will never be in a place of debt. Debt is a no-no in our house. We've never got into debt, never came to a place of borrowing money. We are careful with what gives God gave us. Financial boundaries are very, very important. Life principles that you need to set. Today we live in a world of abortion, fornication. Sex before marriage is fine. Guys, I want to say this to you. You will reap it, the consequences when you enter into your marriage. Because you're entering the marriage with a polluted body, not with an unpolluted body. And soon you will have dissatisfaction, disgruntlement in the way God brought you together in your marriage. Young men and women, guard yourself, protect yourself. Keep that self pure till one day that God brings that wonderful woman or a wonderful man in your life that God has kept in store for you exclusively in the foundations of the earth. He set apart that day for that union to come together. God, protect. Let nobody touch you till that day God has called that one man to come into your life. Say amen, guys. Amen. Keep yourself. Okay. As I conclude, character. Ensure that we pay great emphasis on character as a church. We don't give you responsibilities if you don't see consistency in your character. We are not a church that is 
wanting to become a mega church, absolutely fine. Me and Ram, who started this church, are absolutely clear. Character plays an important role, and we will continue to build on character. Okay? Very simple example. Punctuality is a character principle for us. Very simple. Being on time is a character principle. And we constantly help you to know that it is a character. The day you, are, you lose this character, soon people will feel very sloppy about you. Very sloppy about you. I know of one of the weddings that was happening and I had one of the best drummers in the, in the Wysak church. And the person came and asked me, can I have him for my daughter's wedding? I said, sure, you can have him, but I can't guarantee you whether he'll be on time. Because he's never been on his time ever in his life. Okay? And they choose not to have him. Never, never in his lifetime he's been on time. And that is a sloppy attitude. It may appear cool to you, but it's not cool to anybody else. It's hot for everybody else. Okay? Ensure that your character is built on it. And constantly, God is interested in character. As I conclude, the Bible says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word of God that is planted in you, which can save you, which has the capacity to save you. Some questions for you. Question number one, have you set boundaries for your life? Have you set boundaries? Okay, it is good. It would be a good exercise for you as a family to set some boundaries. Good for you as a family to set some boundaries. Okay, run through the boundaries. Set financial boundaries. Set professional boundaries. Set dating boundaries. Come what may, the most important person in my life is Sunni, not Anagra and Mahima. And they know that. Okay? And so is it for Sunni. After them is them. We have to constantly ensure that we both are in love. It is not my children who fall to me after God. It's my wife. And we need to ensure that we don't make children our God and idolatry before ourselves. It's our spouse that God has brought us together. And that spouse should be the centerpiece of your life. Set fam some family boundaries. Have you shared your boundaries? It's important that you set the boundaries and share the boundaries with somebody else. Maybe your mentor. So that they can hold you accountable for those boundaries. If not, your marriage can have manhandling. Your marriage can have violence. Your professional relationship get, get into unnecessary dating. You can get into other kind of professional violations. Have somebody to account you and hold you accountable for the timelines that you have set. Have you shown your boundaries? Okay? Have you shown your boundaries? Very important that you discuss those boundaries with another person who is your mentor or a guide so that they're able to give you input into your boundaries so that you're able to take it forward. Okay? And finally, Surrender those boundaries to God. Only with God, you will be able to remain well within the safety margin because without God, you will fall outside of the safety margin and you may end up messing your life and a danger can devastate into your life. I want to close here with this topic on boundaries. Think, go back and set some good boundaries for your life, for your professional, for your finances, for your family, take some decisions. Single men, go back. And women, go back and set some boundaries and seal them in the presence of God. Let me just close in prayer this afternoon. Father, we thank you for reminding us through lives like David who one evening in the cool of a day violated five of the ten commandments. And Paul wrote it to us in the book of Corinthians that these things are written so that we don't repeat and fall into the same trespassing attitude. But I pray that you will guard us, protect us as a church, to stand spotless, blameless on the second coming of Jesus, presentable before the Father as a bride of Christ. We thank you for the times when we have gone through some, made some blunders. We ask you to forgive us. And we take this time consciously to guard our heart, our mind, our eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of the heart, that, Lord, we don't fall into any of these categories and that we remain careful in seeing your kingdom built. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.